Okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Sherry Suriano, and um, I'd like to thank the Warren County Library System for inviting me to speak to you tonight about tea. Um, so I'm Sherry Suriano. I'm an associate professor for the Family and Community Health Sciences Department of Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Warren County. And before we get into the presentation, I just want to quickly review what Cooperative Extension is. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is a partnership between the Board of County Commissioners, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, and USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. We have faculty and or staff in 20, all 21 of New Jersey counties, and I am located in Warren County. Um, there are three departments in our uh, cooperative extension, Rutgers Cooperative Extension anyway, and that's the Agriculture and Natural Resources Department, 4-H Youth Development, and my department, um, often shortened to FCHS. So what we do is we provide outreach in New Jersey and beyond on topics that are related to nutrition, chronic disease prevention, food safety, and overall wellness. Um, and we also are, oops, not moving. There we go. An affirmative action equal opportunity employer. Sorry about that. That was not moving. So I'd like to again welcome you. This is the fourth revision of this Functional Foods for Life educational program. I started creating these programs uh, back in 2006 and have updated them through over the years, about every uh, five years or so. And I've just uh, did update them about a year or so ago. So they are part of a functional foods for life educational program and functional foods are those that have potentially beneficial effects on health when they're consumed on a regular basis and at certain levels. Although that's a quote, um, all food, it is, they are, functional foods are not regulated in any way by any governing body of any type. Um, and the, their actual definition is not set in stone. What it really is, um, and the reason we use the word functional food, is because it's used in the literature when looking at specific foods to find out if there are benefits to health. And um, so you will, as you will see, um, this, this, fun, this food, tea, um, seems to have potentially beneficial effects on health, and we will talk more about that as we go forward. So we're going to talk about, first of all, some fun things about plant origin, about historical facts regarding tea, and ways to process and prepare it, and then we'll jump more into the research and the possible health benefits of tea. So important to note that when I say tea, when I'm talking about tea tonight, I'm exclusively talking about the beverage made from the Camellia sinensis plant. So we know the word tea is also used to refer to fruit or herbal infusions, which are known as a tisane or an herbal tea. Tisanes can be made with fresh or dried flowers, leaves, seeds, or even roots by bo pouring boiling water over those plant parts and letting them steep. Um, these herbal teas or tisanes don't have to have any actual tea from the Camellia sinensis plant in them. They can, but they don't have to. So an example of a tisane or an herbal tea is what you see here on the screen. Um, and this, uh, this is chamomile tea. And um, it's just a different type, but when I'm talking about tea itself, it, it's only going to be about the Camellia sinensis plant, especially when I talk about the research. I just want to um, help you to understand that that is what I'm talking about. Um, this photo is probably uh, one of my favorite photos of all times. It is of a Japanese tea plantation with Mount Fuji in the background. And this is um, what Camellia sinensis, the plant, looks like. And it's a place where it is grown today. A little more of a close up is um, are these plants that are about four to six feet high when cultivated. 
actually the Camellia sinensis plant, if grown naturally in the wild, it can grow to about 30 feet high. But as you can imagine, um, not as easy to pick those leaves if it's 30 feet uh, high. So they've been cultivated to grow in these kind of fan-like um, um, ways so that they are lower to the ground, easier to pick. They like to grow in um, wild anyway, in subtropical monsoon-like climates that have really hot, wet, hot summers, cool, dry winters. And they need a lot of sun from, you know, all sun to partial sun. Um, it is native to Southeast Asia. And this is the flower that grows on the Camellia sinensis plant. It's a small, about one and a half inch uh, in diameter flower. It's very fragrant and it blooms in the fall. So a little about the history, um, several thousand years ago, tea wasn't known to man as a beverage. There were Southeast Asian tribes who actually chewed on the leaves of the tea plant, probably learning this idea from seeing animals chewing on it. And the earliest reports of tea consumption were in eating it rather than drinking it. And it's actually still used in this way in parts of Burma and Thailand. How it was discovered that tea could be made by putting the leaf in hot water is, um, seems to be just an accident. They say that it just floated down um, from a tree into somebody's beverage and they into their hot water and they drank it and, um, and they enjoyed it. So it did begin um, this drinking of tea. It began with religious communities in Asia. And then it spread to include the general Chinese population in the next about 1,000 years. By the 16th century, about half of the world was drinking tea. And the positive reaction to tea was in large part as a result of the need for people to have a safe, affordable drink due to ongoing, always, issues with water. Um, interestingly enough, coffee and chocolate are similar to tea in that they are also infusion drinks. An infusion drink is that something that takes a part of a plant and it submerses it in water. And tea came out ahead of coffee and chocolate. Um, they all came, they didn't come at the same time, but within a couple uh, hundreds of years within each other, but tea surpassed coffee and chocolate in, um, in the amount consumed due to its positive attributes. Um, as opposed to coffee and chocolate, tea is very cheap to grow. Um, the plant is very productive by because it bears a new leaf every six weeks. It's pretty easy to prepare, um, but it also can be prepared ceremoniously. You only need a very small amount of tea leaves to prepare it, to make a cup of tea or even a pot of tea. You only need a small amount it can, even though it really likes um, the climate, the subtropical climate, it really can grow in many climates from central China to East Africa. It can be stored for a long time. It's very safe to drink. Um, it provides that beneficial feeling of well being, um, can pretty much be taken throughout the day without side effects. And of course, it tastes delicious. When tea was first becoming popular, as I mentioned, religious um, communities were using it in the beginning. And in particular, those who practiced Taoism and Buddhism in Asia, they found that tea helped them to meditate. They found it also increased their mental acuity. So um, in addition to this, early uses of tea included um, for medicinal medicinal reasons, including for ailments um, uh, in eyesight, in rheumatic pain, with fatigue, um, with cleaning sores. And it was also traded as currency. Um, if any of you have listened to me talk about chocolate, you'll know that the cacao bean was traded as currency. Well, tea was used as currency as well. Um, so kind of like a bartering system. 
And what they, the way that they did this, um, they didn't just, you know, use the leaves, they made bricks of tea. And in this photo, you see the round um, circular th uh, things, they are bricks of tea, where they kind of compress the tea um, into these forms that would make it easy, easier to share or barter with someone else. This practice continues today um, in very remote areas of Central Asia. There were also some groups who made tea into a soup-like concoction. They made it with water and salt and fat, and they drank, um, drank it uh, 70 to 80 cups per day in Tibet as their main source of nutrition. Of course, tea is warming um, and it became very popular in cold areas. And once tea drinking started to spread into Europe, tea time became a way for women to share time with friends and offer hospitality to neighbors, kind of as a social outlet. Because of this, in part, in Britain, tea drinking became a national obsession, as it still is today. So where did this start? Well, it's attributed to a Portuguese princess. Um, her name is Catherine uh, of Braganza. She came to London with a large chest of tea as part of her dowry. And because tea was very expensive still at this time, uh, it took you know, a long time for it to ship from Asia to anywhere in Britain. Um, it was only really only taken by the aristocracy at that time. As time went on, clipper ships were created and they were very fast and were able to bring tea to, uh, from Asia uh, much faster. So it took a while, but by the 19th century, most English subjects were enjoying tea, were able to afford, afford it and enjoying it on a daily basis. Afternoon tea was thought to be created by Anna the Duchess of Bedford in 1840. She started to have a little snack with tea around 4 p.m. in the afternoon to help with what many of us may uh, know as kind of an afternoon slump feeling. And so the afternoon tea was further popularized by Queen Victoria and within her 60 year reign, afternoon tea became a national pastime. Now, high tea is a little bit different or was considered to be different uh, back at this time. Working class people in Britain, they attribute taking high tea by having a meal, which we would probably call dinner or supper, having meats, fish, cheese, salads, and sweets, and with a pot of strong tea at about six in the evening. Now, because the cradle of the tea plant is in South and Southeast Asia, these areas also have strong tea customs. China is considered the actual birthplace of tea drinking, and its recorded use was as early as 551 to 479 BC, according to writings of Confucius. During the Sun Dynasty, the Sung, excuse me, Sung style of tea preparation, which was known as the Sung Tea Ceremony, used powdered tea in ceramics in a ceremony which became actually extinct in China, but later evolved into what we've probably all heard of as the Japanese tea ceremony. Now today in China, tea houses are very common and they remind me when I hear about them um, that they're just in Chinese neighborhoods. They may have a television viewing, karaoke. They almost sound like, uh, like a neighborhood bar um, or even a sports bar, something along those lines. But they're drinking tea, not beer. So in Japan, as you see pictured here, the tea ceremony is a traditional ritual influenced by Zen Buddhism in which powdered green tea, also um, known as matcha, is ceremonially prepared by a skilled practitioner and served to a small group of guests in a tranquil setting. The study of the tea ceremony takes many years and often can last a lifetime. Even to participate as a guest, 
uh, in a formal tea ceremony does require knowledge of the like gestures and phrases and how to act in the tea room. So what about here in the United States? Um, you may not know that tea was very popular early on uh, because many of many of the people who came to America were coming from Europe and they brought their tea drinking uh, habits with them. So in the early years, they um, they were drinking tea. But of course, we've all heard the story that that the British government were were in, um, giving uh, putting high taxes on tea and other items, and so colonists stopped buying tea, and this led to the Boston Tea Party in December 1773. And really, as a result, many started to drink coffee instead, and um, coffee became a more popular drink in the United States, partially due to that reason. To that reason, um, tea you know, some people don't care for coffee, so I'm sure people started to gradually drink it again. What about tea being grown in the United States? Well, there is the Charleston Tea Garden, if you haven't heard of it. It is really the only place that is known to grow tea in the United States. It started um, in the 1880s by a doctor, uh, Shepherd. And his plantation was actually in South Carolina on the mainland. When this uh, doctor passed away in 1950, this 1915, um, the his tea garden just remained dormant for a very long time. Not until the 1960s did somebody take those plants and transfer them to what is Wadmala Island, also in South Carolina. And in the 80s, as someone else purchased it, they turned it into the commercial operation it is today, the Charleston Tea Garden. But it's been run since about 2003 by Bigelow, which is a, um, it's a, you know, it's a tea company and they run it now. They consider it a true American icon and it's not actually in Charleston. It's about 20 miles uh, southwest of Charleston. So we do drink tea, but a majority a majority of it is consumed as black tea. And as you can see, 84% as black tea and 85% of that is as iced tea. Most people in this country love tea. They love iced tea. They also use tea bags. And interestingly enough, the United States um, invented both the tea bag and iced tea in 1904. So where is tea coming from? Well, as I said, it, in the last 500 years or so, tea drinking has spread to cover the globe. It's now the most widely consumed beverage in the world, second only to water. In fact, world consumption is equal to all other manufactured beverages put together, and that's including coffee. They drink a lot more tea in other countries. It's grown primarily in mountainous areas of the world and the leading tea producing countries in order of their production amounts per ton are China, India, Kenya, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Turkey, Iran, and Indonesia. Classification of tea is determined by the processing method that the leaves undergo, um, also known as the amount of oxidation the leaves receive. And oxidation means exposure to air while drying. So there are four main types of tea, white, green, oolong, and black tea. We're gonna talk about each one of those. So this is a photo of white tea leaves. White tea is very different. It's very special. It's made from the young, tender leaves that undergo no oxidation, and it is the least processed of all the tea varieties. The leaves are picked by hand just before the leaf opens. So as a result, the amount can be that, that can be produced is pretty small, and it um, also makes white tea kind of expensive. 
It's a very mild tea if you haven't tasted it before. And for this reason, it's often paired with flavors like fruit flavors, for example, um, peach, white tea, uh, things like that. Now, green tea has always been popular in Asia. It continually increases in popularity in Europe and in the Americas due to health claims. The way that green tea is processed makes it different than the other three types. So um, it does not it, um, have, have oxidation. Um, it's eliminated. That phase is eliminated. And the enzymes are destroyed in a different way. They are um, done either through steam, which is a traditional Japanese method, or by dry cooking in hot pans. And that's a traditional Chinese method. And this is before the leaves are rolled and fired. Oolong tea, we don't hear as much about, but for this type of tea, it is oxidized and it is um, the oxidation time frame is between two and three days. So it's kind of between black and green teas in strength and color. And as you'll see, when we put black tea leaves next to those oolong leaves or even green, it is black. It is totally black. So most of the world drinks black tea. 98% of tea sold is black tea. And it is completely oxidized, which is why the color is so dark. The grading of black tea um, is according to guidelines from the British tea industry since the 19th century. So tea leaves are either whole leaves, pretty much what you're seeing here, and they are thought to produce the best flavor. They're classified by size and the way they're rolled. There's also broken leaves. Some of them in here you can see are broken leaves. And they, they're thought to make high quality tea as well. The other two types are dust, which are small pieces of leaves, and fannings, which are even smaller pieces of leaves and are often referred to as dust. And dust and fannings, those type, those um, pieces of the leaves are what is usually found in tea bags. So what about all the names we hear when we are uh, buying tea or ordering tea, say in a tea room, uh, things like breakfast tea. So they are identified primarily by the region or estate where it, they are grown. And that's the pure tea. So for example, Assam tea, often used in breakfast teas, is grown in Assam, India. Darjeeling tea is grown in Darjeeling, India. So they are, you can buy pure Assam tea or pure Darjeeling tea, but they, we often are buying teas that are mixtures of several different types of teas. There's also flavored teas, um, for example, um, a flavored tea could be masala chai, um, becoming more and more popular all the time. The, um, um, the masala chai is something that um, has, if you're not familiar with it, it's made with black tea. It has a sweetener, milk or other creamer in it and spices like cardamom, cinnamon and ginger. And what masala chai means is spiced tea. The word chai in Hindu means tea. So um, I've heard people say they want a chai tea. So they're basically wanting a tea tea. But the correct um, way to say this is masala chai. There's also subgroups of tea. So orange pico tea, we often see on a box with tea bags in it. And that's just a subgroup of black tea. Yellow and kokicha teas are both subgroups of green tea. And I find kokicha tea fascinating. It's a winter tea. So basically they use every single part of the tea plant. Um, they use the twigs and the pruned leaves of, of the dormant plant. They roast it over a fire. And this is a very inexpensive tea that was developed using these you know, leftover pieces that couldn't be made into the other types um, of teas. 
So what do we get when we drink tea? Are we getting much? We actually are, are um, not a lot of energy. There's only about two calories in an eight ounce um, cup of brewed tea, but we are getting some various amounts, small amounts of minerals like magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, very small amount of sodium, and actually a not too small amount of fluoride. Fluoride is in tea, it does absorb it through the, um, through the soil, and it's a natural source of fluoride. Tea, as you, I'm sure you know, also contains some stimulants. Caffeine is one of them. Although it does contain ca caffeine, it is about half the amount of caffeine that you would find in brewed coffee. And theobromine is also in tea. Um, theobromine is another type of central nervous uh, system stimulant. There are also polyphenols in tea, and this is primarily what has been studied with tea. So I wanted to mention it before we go into all of the research. Um, what I'm showing here is there are different types of polyphenols in the different types of tea. And that is because, again, of the oxidation. So you may have heard of catechins or EGCG, which is found primarily in green tea. It's been heavily studied and is something that is not really found in black tea because of the oxidation level. What happens is the, those substances, they are um, converted into different um, types of polyphenols, the aerubigans and theoflavins, which are also studied. Oolong tea has some of its own as well. There's also an amino acid found in green tea called L-theanine, which has also been studied. And this is just a schematic showing what I was just saying, like the more that there is processing done to the tea leaves, um, the less amount of catechins are in it. So the research on tea is um, interesting. And what I have to talk about today, if you've ever attended one of these talks in the past, it's it's a little bit differently. It's a little bit different. Things have changed a bit um, over time, but let's start at the beginning. So historically, tea has been thought to be beneficial to health um, for you know thousands of years. It's been used as a traditional form of medicine in Chinese medicine for truly thousands of years. The more recent study of tea, which has been undertaken to determine its specific potential benefits to health, have really only been underway for the last 30 to 50 years. As with most research, it starts with animal studies. If you're in science at all, you, you do know this. If not, um, it's just the way that it does start to see if there's a, if there's, if there's a, um, an indication to go further on with it and start to study in populations. So these animal studies were very positive, indicating potential health benefits. And so um, population studies began. So far, they have uh, rendered some inconsistent re results. And we'll talk more about them as we talk about each of the chronic diseases um, that um, have been studied. They also have found that um, there may be an issue with some um, the availability in our bodies to process polyphenols or have them help us with the protection against disease. Whereas caffeine and theanine um, are both highly available in our bodies and can be very and can be very helpful. It's also important to think about the sample size of each study to determine how much we can interpret from it. And much of the research on humans have had very small sample sizes. So let's talk about cancer first, cancer prevention. A, help, a possible health benefit of tea consumption is its potential lowering of cancer risk in humans. And this has been demonstrated in specific organ sites in studies with animals. In fact, for many, many different 
um, sites in the body, it has shown protection. And because of these positive outcomes, there were high hopes for a connection between tea intake and cancer prevention in people. But unfortunately, the large population studies on cancer prevention as a result of tea have been inconsistent and there need to be more studies done. One possible um, uh, potentially um, positive outcome has been limited evidence that show that, um, that tea intake may reduce the risk of bladder cancer. And this was uh, announced um, in the third global report by the World Cancer Research Fund and American Institute of Cancer Research of just recently, uh, just a few years ago. So also intervention studies, which mean those that look at how a cancer patient may benefit from tea intake, they include using extracts and they've also been inconsistent. There are several studies with the use of green tea polyphenols that are in progress in the United States, China, and Japan. So hopefully we will begin to hear more over the next few years. Now, metabolic syndrome, weight uh, loss, and diabetes have been considered as well in studies. So if you're, if you're not familiar, metabolic syndrome occurs when you have uh, symptoms that include an elevated waist circumference, so you know a big belly, and two of the following other symptoms, high triglycerides, an abnormal glucose level, high blood pressure, and low HDL cholesterol. You need to have two of those, and then the large waist measurement. And metabolic syndrome is important because it's an early indicator of type 2 diabetes, and it's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So anything that can decrease the, the likelihood of this is definitely worth looking into. Again, there were consistent animal studies um, on this, but they were not as consistent with the population studies. So um, there were some positive outcomes with green tea extracts. Um, however, um, there, there is nothing definitive at this time. Um, with a decrease in weight and metabolic syndrome, a reduction in type two diabetes would be expected. So this association was found in some but not all studies and in a review of the positive studies, a lower risk of type two diabetes was found by drinking three to four cups of tea per day. And they did not specify whether it was green, uh, black, oolong or white tea. How about cardiovascular disease? Well, with green tea, um, the antioxidant effects of tea polyphenols, especially from green tea, have been found to provide protection against cardiovascular disease in population studies, so with people. Um, the studies have indicated a reduced risk of coronary artery disease by 28% through green tea um, consumption, but no significant protective effect from black tea. Neurodegenerative diseases include Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's diseases, and they all can result in a loss of cognitive function. There's also a type of dementia that can um, that's caused by a stroke that can result in the loss of cognitive, cognitive function. And positively, several large population studies have indicated that tea may improve cognitive function, especially in older women. Consumption of green tea in particular has been found to decrease the risk for cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease, and tea drinking in general is associated with a moderate risk reduction for Parkinson's disease. There's an overall lower incidence of Parkinson's disease found in areas of the world, like, like geographic areas of the world where tea drinking is more common and population studies have been conducted. Now I mentioned that amino acid theanine that's in green tea and 
It's thought to play an important role in this since it crosses the blood brain barrier. Several studies have indicated that theanine may relieve symptoms of anxiety in schizophrenia, may improve memory and attention in individuals with mild cognitive impairment. And it's also being studied uh, for depression, stress, and insomnia assistance. Some very new information that I have for you regarding cor the coronavirus and tea is very interesting. Um, it has been known that green tea catechins, especially EGCG, has been shown to help protect against viral infections, things like hepatitis B and herpes, Zika. And the three main types of theoflavin in black tea were tested and found to be protective against hepatitis C virus. So not, um, not with population studies with people, but in simulated studies, um, computational studies, like on a computer, it has been suggested that tea may have a positive effect against the um, SARS-CoV-2 or the coronavirus infections. So it's a viral infection and it's going to be studied for this um, because simulated studies suggest that it may provide protection. Early on in 2020, as a result of these simulated antiviral results, Many questioned if tea could be helpful in protecting against COVID-19 now. Like, don't wait for the studies. It's tea. Um, it's not anything dangerous. So in Sri Lanka in 2020, intake of Ceylon black tea was promoted in the hopes of boosting the immunity of its people. And black tea intake was also promoted by the Indian Tea Association for the same reason. And hope to really hear more on this in the coming years as they do actual studies. So to review, we do have some inconsistencies with human studies. Antioxidant activity may help in disease prevention and a moderate intake of tea is recommended. There is some um, possible beneficial um, benefits from the amino acid L-theanine and also um, from caffeine and other stimulants, but overall more research is, is really needed. Some other health effects that I should I need to mention um, and because of how tea affects us in the body um, is importantly, if we've known for a long time that tea and coffee decrease iron absorption. So if someone is uh, someone is iron deficient, they would want to drink tea away from their meals. Uh, our bodies have a hard time absorbing iron in general. So if we're introducing something that makes it even harder for our bodies to absorb iron, we want to make sure that we, um, that we are keeping tea and coffee away from our food where the iron um, is. And also you wouldn't want to take it with your iron uh, supplement if your doctor has ordered one for you. Tea has been associated with higher bone mineral density measurements in older women indicating it may be protective against bone fracture, bone fractures. So that's a great thing. As we mentioned, it has fluoride, so it promotes oral health. Uh, vitamin K, excuse me, vitamin K is in green tea. And if you take Coumadin, you'll know why I'm mentioning that. Um, people with who take Coumadin need to be aware that vitamin K is in green tea. Some um, kind of newer information uh, from studies is that drinking very hot tea may be associated with cancer of the upper GI tract, including the esophagus. So studies have shown that drinking very hot tea was strongly associated with a higher risk of esophageal cancer than drinking lukewarm or warm tea. And drinking tea two to three minutes or less than two minutes after being poured increases that risk compared to drinking it four or more minutes after it's poured. So if you like your tea really hot, like I do, it's, it's really hard to do. 
but this seems pretty convincing that we want to wait just a little bit longer, let it cool down a little bit before we drink it. Um, and as we know, tea has caffeine in it, and caffeine has the same effects um, from tea as it does from other products. So caffeine can cause restlessness, palpitations, sleep disorders, even um, stomach pain and headaches. All of these health effects are attributed to consuming tea as a beverage. Now, when tea extracts or polyphenols are taken as supplements, often for the purpose of weight reduction, because some studies have shown that it may be beneficial, you want to be very careful. Some supplement doses can reach or exceed 1,000 milligrams, and that they have been linked to damage or toxicity of the liver, kidneys, and intestine. So be, be very careful with that. I often get asked about decaffeinated um, beverages, decaffeinated tea and coffee. And the most popular way to decaffeinate uh, these days is the supercritical carbon dioxide method. It is um, used almost exclusively now, um, Almost, almost, almost 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I, you know, I wasn't able to say that, but uh, people are, uh, companies, producers are using these, the supercritical carbon dioxide method because it's clean, it's safe, it's non-toxic. It basically um, just pumps the, the carbon dioxide into a chamber where the tea is, which very safely takes the caffeine um, out of the tea and it not only protects the tea taste, but it also protects those health-promoting components, polyphenols, for example, that we were talking about. Uh, as with a lot of my programs, I like to just mention sustainability, and I do so to educate you about three sustainable um, designations and not necessarily to promote purchasing of sustainable products, really just to inform you and to help you make educated choices. So um, the National Organic Program is um, where we get our symbol USDA organic. Uh, it has, anything with that symbol has to be certified by approved organizations. And, uh, and they can only use items like pesticides that are from the list of allowed and prohibited substances. So I mentioned that tea is um, only grown in one place in the United States. So you may have, know, have seen USDA organic seals on tea from other countries. And that's possible through organizations like Quality Assurance International, which is USDA accredited. And it, also, and it you know, uses all the same guidelines that the National Organic Program uses so that they can Put that symbol on their product. Another type of sustainable um, products is fair trade certified. Something that's is fair trade certified and wears its seal was made according to rigorous social, environmental, and economic standards. Fair trade works closely with companies and their suppliers to assure that the people making fair trade certified products are working in safe condition, conditions, they're protecting the environment, they're building sustainable livelihoods, and they're earning additional money to empower and uplift their communities. There are many products that you can find, including tea, that are fair trade certified. And finally, we have the Rainforest Alliance. Tea plants grown by farmers who have earned the Rainforest Alliance certified seal protect shade trees, they plant native species, they maintain wildlife corridors, and they conserve natural resources. They're also expected to use biological and natural alternatives to ban pesticides, and overall their aim is to create a world where people and nature thrive in harmony. So how about making tea, preparing tea? So I'm sure that we've all, um, if you're a tea drinker, you've made tea where you just pour tea into a teacup with your tea bag in there, and that's totally fine. But if you're interested in knowing how to make like a really special tea, you're having um, someone over for tea, or you just um, want to try it, 
the, there are four golden rules, um, so-called from um, Tea USA, and to make a delicious cup of hot black tea, according to them, is to use a teapot. You want to bring fresh, cold tap water that is filtered. Um, if your water is highly chlorinated, you want to use filtered water and you want to bring it to a full boil. You want to use two, uh, use one teaspoon or tea bag per cup. And you want to pour the boiling water over the tea and steep it for three to five minutes for black tea. For the best flavor, um, you also would want to preheat that teapot. Just put a little hot water in it, especially in the winter when it's cold, it's sitting out on your counter, it's pretty cold. And if you warm it, um, it will also help the tea taste amazing. Uh, once you um, have poured the hot water into the tea pot, you want to cover it with a cozy to retain the heat while it's steeping. And then steep for three to five minutes and enjoy. For the other teas, you want to follow those rules, except for green tea. When the water comes to a boil, remove it from the heat and allow it to cool a little for about 10 minutes. You want to pour this water, it's still hot, it's just not boiling, over the green tea and allow it to brew for about one minute before serving. For oolong and white teas, use hot, not boiling water between about 180, 190 degrees. Um, broiling water will scorch the delicate leaf-like white tea for sure. Steep oolong tea for five to seven minutes and white tea for three to four minutes. Now, of course, that the brewing times can all change based on your taste, what you like, um, et cetera. You should also store tea from being exposed to air, light, odor, heat, and moisture. According to the healthy beverage guidelines, we want to drink tea as part of a healthful diet that includes other plant foods. Uh, water, of course, is the main um, beverage of choice. It's uh, the number one beverage of choice. And unsweetened coffee and tea are in that second level there, second recommended beverage of choice. So the cons consumption of tea is for many a ritual that can refresh and renew, and if only for a short while, seems capable of evaporating some of the stresses of life. So particularly in times that we've been going through lately, um, in addition to providing health of benefits, the drinking of tea from the Camellia sinensis plant also appears kind of anecdotally to provide a reduction in stress and a feeling of calm, as this poem so beautifully illustrates. When I drink tea, I am conscious of peace. The cool breath of heaven rises in my sleeves and blows my cares away. As I mentioned, I have several other functional foods for life educational programs, many of which I've um, thankfully provided to the Warren County Library folks um, and uh, really appreciate their interest in my programs. And at this time, um, we are going to ask you to complete a very short poll. I think it's four or five questions. And that is because in my position, I'm required to show that my what I do is, um, is beneficial to others. So if you can take a moment to answer those four or five questions, um, I'll be ha happy to answer any questions you might have once we're finished with the poll. And um, it should be showing up on your screen. Oh, there it is. So please answer um, the questions. And if you have any questions, I will go ahead and take a look at them and see if I can answer them. Someone mentioned that their favorite type of tea is jasmine tea. Um, I am not familiar with jasmine tea. I do um, I do apologize. I'm not sure what it is in it and if it's made with com the Camellia sinensis plant tea leaves. So is it a black tea? I think it is, but I don't know for sure. So my apologies. I've never had jasmine tea. Um, the second question, uh, let me just take a look. Is tea a stimulant for everyone? Well, 
um, some people, so it's saying this person has never had a problem with drinking tea before going to bed and they never noticed a problem. Yeah, many people um, are very lucky and can say that. And it is because we all uh, we all process caffeine differently. Some people will find that caffeine does not affect them in any way, shape, or form. And others will say they can drink tea um, only in the morning, or they cannot they cannot tolerate caffeine from any product whatsoever. So everybody is a little bit different. And um, yeah, that doesn't surprise me that you're you're finding this. Um, you're not unusual, um, but good for you. I, I consider you to be very lucky. I have to watch exactly what time it is um, for any caffeine at all. Um, and you're welcome. There's someone who said thank you. Oh, okay. Green tea is someone believes it is with jasmine flowers for flavor. So it's green tea flavored with jasmine flowers. Green tea is a very uh, mild tea as well. It's a totally different taste. Um, in addition to the processing, changing the type of polyphenols, it also changes the taste of those tea leaves. So if you've done a side-by-side -side, uh, taste of green tea, um, all the four types of teas or just even green tea and black tea, you'll notice there's a significant different in difference in taste. Um, green tea is dried before it is baked. No, it's, um, I believe that it is so that it can be, um, um, so that it can be in the form that is so it's dry, but then they do bake it. Um, either they steam it or they use the pan frying method. And um, I don't know if it's for storage purposes. That's what they're asking here. Um, but it it may be, it may be for that reason. Um, it's not clear why they do it. It's just that it is not completely um devoid of moisture just by drying it. And I think that helps to get the get the moisture out. Oh, yes. Uh, let's see. The, are there any health benefit findings that are different for decaffeinated tea? Um, that is something that has not been well studied. I definitely, I have definitely looked into that and they're not sure uh, at this time whether or not there is a difference for decaffeinated tea. The uh, supercritical carbon dioxide method is showing um, it's main maintaining, retaining, I should say, more of the polyphenols in the type of tea. So in the past, some of the decaffeination methods were depleting the teas of their polyphenols, and they probably um, at that time would not have been beneficial. But they there's there's so little research just on um, regular tea so far that they haven't really delved into decaffeinated tea enough for there to be any um, any kind of accumulated research to talk about. Um, Adding milk or sweeteners. Um, sweeteners, I don't detract, think detract from the benefits, but I, I've seen very small amounts of studies that show that milk may detract a little bit, but there's nothing, there's nothing significant, nothing um, what I would say to worry about if you enjoy milk in your tea. Um, there's, there's just not enough there. Uh, to to worry about. Um, somebody asked me if I would put up that photo. I'm going to see if I can go backwards at all. Um, the photo of Mount Fuji again, and it's for some reason, maybe because of the pole. I'm not really sure. Um, it won't let me go backwards. I'm going to try again. Let me see if I can try again. Oh, there we go. This person is from Japan and she would like to see that photo. That's lovely. It is a beautiful photo. Almost there. There we go. Enjoy. Let's see. Any other questions?
questions? No, I don't have any other questions here. I don't know why it's clear, not clear, oh, why it's not clearing them. I've answered all the ones that are here. It's just not clearing them. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, I want to thank you so much for answering the poll and for joining us this evening. Um, I look forward to seeing some of you again in a future program. And thank you again to the Warren County Library System for having me here tonight. Have a great night. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh. Just so you know, I did answer all those questions. <laughs> they just won't, it just won't clear it. I'm not really sure why. <laughs>